Um, as Penny mentioned, my name is Liam Boye, and I'm here today representing my company, uh, Broken Rock Resources, which is a small, privately held company uh, with about 12 early stage exploration projects in northwestern Ontario. Today, I'm going to talk about the Wishbone BMS project, um, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of how I used Geosoft Target and Leapfrog. So the outline of my talk is very basic. Um, I'm going to start by talking about how I use Geosoft Target for data exploration, targeting, georeferencing, and compilation, and then how I use Leapfrog Geo to kind of um, work up that target more and, and build a, a more robust model. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of the Wishbone VMS project. Um, so we're going to start where I started, which is with data exploration. So throughout my career, I've been involved in a number of different targeting exercises. Um, and so a typical one is that a company or someone tells me, okay, we want to find this type of deposit and we need it to have this criteria and this distance from infrastructure and its own population of unicorns. And um, that's not really how I like to do exploration. I take a, a slightly different approach when I'm, a, when I'm doing it for myself. Um, I do more data-led exploration. And uh, luckily, the government of Ontario has a wealth of publicly available data, including geophysical data, geochemical data, assessment reports. And um, it's my opinion that there are, there's just innumerable undiscovered targets just in that data waiting to be found. Um, so I started going through this, and I, I, I do an exercise called, what's that? So I just sift through different types of data, geochemical, geophysical. Uh, in this case, I started with um, a regional geophysical data set, uh, and I started looking at little anomalies saying, what's that? And I've actually discovered a lot of mines this way. Um, all of the mines have been previously discovered, but I, I did subsequently discover them. <laughs> and uh, so in this case, I saw this little mag bullseye, and you know, the lovely thing in Target is you can zoom in, and there's really a lot of different ways to visualize your data. Um, I am not a geophysicist, but there's nothing I hate more than going to a project and asking to see the geophysical data and being given a JPEG. I can't do anything with a JPEG. No matter what type of data I'm looking at, I want to look at the actual data so that I can manipulate it. So anyways, I'm going through this data and I see this little mag bullseye and I think, great, I've found a Kimberlite. Um, but those of you who are paying attention to the title of my talk know that uh, I didn't stick with that. So I got this mag bullseye and I thought, right, um, I need to find more data. Um, just as a side note, the actual, the, um, McFold's VMS in the Ring of Fire was actually discovered uh, through Kimberlite exploration. So a diamond company was going through, found a meg bullseye, drilled it, and they discovered the uh, McFold's VMS in the Ring of Fire. So in Target, there's a great little button that's really well named. It's called Seek Data. So if you have your little anomaly like I did, you can go up and click the little button at the top that says Seek Data, and it connects you to different data sets, and you can then download information from servers like lakes layers or other geophysical data sets. So I started there um, acquiring more data. Um, and so it's a good place to start. Uh, if you have your own data servers, you can also connect to those. Um, that wasn't my only source of data, but that's where I started. And I feel like Geosoft gets a lot of good press for being a great uh, geophysical uh, program or Geosoft Target, but um, from my perspective, it doesn't get talked about enough for how good it is at um, coordinate conversions and georeferencing. There's really great tools in there if you have to co uh, translate things between different coordinate systems or create local grids, uh, you know, if you're working in an area that has a mine. And uh, so that's what I use it for. And I know this is a really scary slide because when you see that, you're like, ooh, that's a PDF, and that means data entry. And where we're going in this presentation is we're going to a really nice 3D model, and I think any of us who've built a 3D model know that you don't get there with a lot of, without a lot of this kind of tedious work. So when I went and looked for data, I found regional geophysics, I found topography. Uh, the regional geophysics was in NAT83, the topography was in lat longs, the public geologic maps were PDFs that had to be georeferenced, the drill database was NAD27, 
So I had to take all of these different data sets and make them work well together. So that's what I did. And when I brought it all together and got it to play well, I found that my little mag high was sitting right in a greenstone belt, right at a contact between Mafic and Felsic Volcanics, which is a great thing for a VMS target. Um, and I looked at the nearby drill holes, and they had massive and stringer sulfides in them, elevated zinc, elevated silver, elevated gold. These were all good things. Um, exhalate units like iron formation and chert. And uh, I was starting to get you know, pretty excited about this target. There was also a nice coincident EM anomaly. So you've got that mag anomaly, which would be your high-grade magnetite core with the zinc. And then the EM anomaly is kind of off to the side because the zinc would be less conductive. And so I was really excited. And when I zoomed out for a bit of a larger picture, um, my target is over there on the left in the Abonga Lake Greenstone Belt. But if you just go straight west, you hit the Sturgeon Lake Greenstone Belt which was host to five historic VMS deposits, uh, uh, including the Matabi mine, which produced over uh, 11 million tons at 8% zinc. And um, talking with some of the regional geologists, these are very similar geologic environments and possibly related greenstone belts. So at this point, I was really excited about this target, and I was ready to hit the ground. However, this target, you know, it wasn't part of a targeting exercise, so. Um, it's located in a relatively remote greenstone belt, about 250 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. And while there were roads that went almost right to the project, um, they were decommissioned after logging. And the water crossings were taking at, taken out, which removed pretty much all practical access to this entire greenstone belt. So at this point, um, I had a decision to make, either let go of this target or invest money in um, helicopter time, which for a big company would probably not be a major consideration, but uh, for my company it was. And talking with my main investor, um, they were apprehensive to invest a lot of money in a very high risk Greenfields uh, exploration target, especially when that money was coming from our mortgage. So <laughs> I, uh, I had to do a little bit more work to convince them. So that's when I jumped kind of from that targeting exercise that I did in uh, Geosoft Target over to LeapFrog, and I thought, right, I'm going to take all this information, and I'm going to build a model, and I'm going to try to answer questions like, is there a volume there that would make this interesting to spend a bit of money on? How well do I understand the geology? So that's what I did. Um, and just a note here, you can see that there's a, a map there. This was a black and white map, and I think sometimes people see these black and white maps and they're covered in structural measurements and they're from the 60s and they think, oh man, that would take forever to digitize and you know, we'll just go with a more recent map. But um, actually in LeapFrog, there, there's no need for that step of digitizing your map. You don't need to go into ARC and, and create lines, really, at, you know, whether it's a level plan or a cross section or these old maps, you just bring them into LeapFrog and you can just start working, putting structural disks in and putting contacts in without that intermediate step. So that's what I did, and because it's LeapFrog, it makes really nice videos, so I made a video, and it hasn't started, so I think I can press start here. So I started with that little mag bullseye, and um, then I overlaid the EM data, and so the mag bullseye would be like the high-grade magnetite zinc core, and then on the edges, you'd expect to see kind of higher EM for uh, your, your um, pyrite and pyrotite, and so I liked the way that looked. So then I brought in that, um, geologic map and started creating a model from the units. You can see there's a lot of structural measurements, there's a lot of contacts, there's faults in there. So I just started putting it together from that historic map. And as I mentioned previously, um, that little anomaly fell right in a contact between Felsic and Mafic Volcanics. You can see the MA on there, they noted that magnetic anomaly back in the 60s, but the survey that I used wasn't flown until 2004. And then I've shown the historic drill holes there where they intersected massive sulfide about, uh, I think it's about 600 meters to the north and 700 meters to the south, and massive sulfide deposits aren't big. So I just molded in a little volume. Uh, there's room to make a bigger volume. There's also room to make a smaller volume. Um, but just to kind of represent where that mag feature is so that I could start to have an idea of whether or not this would be a worthwhile target to pursue. And again, because it's LeapFrog, it's got some great drill hole planning tools, so um, 
I laid out some drill holes to test the target I came up with. I'm just showing the Felsic Volcanics there. And um, yeah, and I also threw in a couple of extra holes to have a look at that EM anomaly in case my main target didn't work out, because this is exploration. So uh, this is what I put together to kind of better evaluate what my risk and my opportunity was here. Um, I didn't want to stop, though, just at looking at this little area, because <laughs> when I started at looking at this, I had the only claims in this greenstone belt. I referred to it as my greenstone belt. So I decided to <laughs> zoom out and actually extend my model. One of the great things about LeapFrog 2 is the ability to work at different scales. So even though that was kind of my project scale, I wanted to kind of zoom out, so I ended up modeling the entire greenstone belt. This model is still in work in process. It's not perfect, but um, I started looking at where I could have other opportunities, and actually I came up with another target. And so there it's the awkward lake. Uh, it's a layered mafic intrusion, and I saw this little kind of high EM conduit, and I looked at old drill holes, and of course they had massive sulfide and gabbro, never assayed. Uh, so that is now a nice uh, PG nickel copper target that I have. So again, this is located in the Obonga Lake Greenstone Belt, and it's just kind of showing how you know, modeling helps evaluate your risk and also identify new opportunities. And just to refresh you on where that is, um, it's again in the Obonga Lake Greenstone Belt, just about 80 kilometers due east of the Sturgeon Lake Greenstone Belt, which was host to those five VMS deposits. And these are both located about 250 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is where I live. So that's my model. So with that, now this is an exploration target, so we're not going to talk about tons and grade and things like that. So these numbers are fake numbers, um, because you don't talk about early exploration targets as much as you'd like to. Um, so I just put in a random volume there that is not the volume of the shape I modeled, but what you would do if you wanted to evaluate it is you'd take the volume of the shape you'd model, multiply it by a density for massive sulfide, come up with some tons, look at some surrounding deposits, and go, right, if I had this tons in this grade, what could that be worth? And then make a decision. Do I want to invest in this target or not? Um, so that's, that's basically how I look at mitigating risk in early exploration targets. Um, it allows me to have a working hypothesis. A lot of people have told me, I can't build a model, I don't have enough drill data, I don't have enough this. I think you can build a model with almost no data at all. It's a hypothesis to test. It helps you focus your efforts on answering questions. Um, the questions I was answering are, is there room for the volume required to make this interesting? Can I model it? Um, this would, you know, VMS deposits can be relatively easy to model, but definitely narrow vein gold deposits. You can spend a lot of money on drilling to find out that, you know what, actually, even though I've got high grade, I, I don't have the volume here to make it hang together. So, being able to, to come up with a model before you invest too much is important and allows you to communicate some opportunities and risks. So, yeah, we decided to go ahead with it. And so, since making that decision, we've completed uh, three little programs, two field reconnaissance programs to verify alteration in lithology and mineralization, and then a small uh, walking mag survey in the winter to refine that mag target because it actually is under a lake, which is not a bad thing for VMS because it's soft. Um, and then I spend a bunch of time on stakeholder engagement, so meeting with all the stakeholders in the First Nations groups and making sure that I had built those relationships. And as a result, when I submitted my drill permits, everyone was on board and they just got approved last Tuesday. So yeah, thank you. That concludes my talk.